In this module, we will go through chapter seven and eight, non-current assets and depreciation, and liabilities and equity. So we know from prior classes, we've talked about non-current assets. So non-current assets are those that are likely to be converted to cash or able to be converted to cash within one year. And so below, you can see examples of those. So accounts receivable, right? That's money that we've earned, but we haven't received from our, our sales or our customers yet, but we expect them to pay <coughs> within the next year. Notes receivable is generally a loan that we've given, which is a short term inventory and prepaid rent are other examples. So those are current assets. Non-current assets <coughs> are what we refer to as PP&E, right? Plant, property, and equipment, and uh, long-term investments and things like that. Here you can see um, we record our assets generally at cost, right? Which includes all expenses to get the assets ready. So what does that exactly mean? So if we buy an MRI machine for $150,000 and it, we have to spend $5,000 to have it delivered and another $5,000 to have it installed, what is our cost for that MRI? So it's 150 plus the five plus the five or 160,000. And so if we were to do the journal entry for that, and assuming we were to take a note or a loan out for the purchase, we would record it by debiting PP&E for $160,000, and we would credit notes payable for $160,000. Notes payable is a liability. So when we buy equipment, we need to then allocate the cost of that equipment over its useful life. So in the example of the MRI machine, if its useful life is five years, we would take the $160,000 and depreciate that over the five-year period. So to figure that out, it would be $160,000 divided by five, which would be $32,000. So we would do a journal entry to record depreciation expense for $32,000 and the reason that we do that again is that of that $160,000 MRI machine we are saying $32,000 of that is being used up each year and should be offset against the income that that machine generates. So when we go to when we purchase an asset the MRI for example for $160,000 <clears throat> After five years, is it really worthless? Do we know that going into it? We don't. So this is an example where we make an estimate. We estimate that the useful life is five years. And here, we may buy an MRI machine and say, well, after five years, you know what? We're going to want the newest and the greatest. So we're going to get rid of that MRI machine after five years. And we think we can sell that MRI machine for $10,000. <clears> and so then the depreciation would really be 150,000 divided by five, right? Five years, and so that would be $30,000. So summarizing, um, what happens when we record depreciation is that it reduces <coughs> the value of the asset, the MRI machine, after one year would be 160,000 less 30,000 or $130,000 <clears> and we also have an expense related to that which reduces our income. So when we record depreciation, remember the entry is always the same. <clears throat> we debit depreciation expense and we credit accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation is the account on the balance sheet that offsets the PP and E, and so that is called a contra asset. Remember, contra against the asset. So against the asset PP and E, we have accounts accumulated depreciation. So let's review the journal entry. So again, 
we always debit depreciation expense and we credit accumulated depreciation. What is the effect on the balance sheet? So the effect accumulated depreciation has on the balance sheet, because remember this is a contra asset account, will be on the balance sheet, is to reduce the value of the asset PP&E. What is the effect on the P&L? So depreciation expense is obviously an expense, and so that reduces the income on the P&L. So P&L is another word, profit and loss statement is another word for income statement. Remember the components of our income statement are revenue less expenses equals net income. And so if our expenses go up by 30,000, our net income goes down. So after five years, the book value of the MRI, what would it be like? So we have 150,000 that we're <coughs> depreciating divided by five years or 30,000 a year. So at the end of five years, we would have 150,000 of accumulated depreciation. But the actual value um, would still be $10,000 because remember we had $5,000 shipping and $5,000 to get it ready. And so um, that would remain on the books. So what if we were able to sell the MRI after five years and we had, remember, anticipated that we would get $10,000, but what if we only got $2,000? Well, um, in fact, in this example, actually, I don't have that $10,000 in there. So let's go with just the cost of one hundred and fifty. dollars and we have accumulated depreciation of 150, so our book value is zero, and so we have a $2,000 gain. So our entry is going to be cash, because we got $2,000, and we want to take this asset off the books, and so we debit accumulated depreciation and we credit equipment or PP&E and then we have a gain on disposition. So what type of account do you think gain on disposition is? So remember when I asked that you have five choices, right? Is it an asset, liability, equity, which are the components of the balance sheet, or is it a revenue and expense? So in this case gain on disposition is a revenue account. So we're going to record revenue of $2,000 and cash of $2,000. And then this debit, debiting accumulated depreciation and crediting equipment takes that asset off of our books because we no longer have it. So again, in summation, uh, the reason we use depreciation is to allocate the cost of an asset each year in which it provides services. The original cost is known, right? That's what we paid for it, what cost to put it in services. And then the estimated useful life is an estimate, as is the residual value, if there is any. The book value of the PPE represents the amount that is not yet expensed. So that is the cost less accumulated depreciation, would be the book value. So next we're going to talk about intangible assets. So intangible assets are those that aren't tangible or aren't, you can't put your fingers on, right? So examples of those are goodwill, trademarks, patents, and we recognize those um, as assets and we amortize their expense over their useful life. So if you have a patent that's good for 10 years, you would amortize it over 10 years and it works the same way as depreciation. So that's chapter seven. Let's go into chapter eight, liabilities and equity. Um, current liabilities work the same way as current assets. They come due within a year. And you can look at the example in uh, the Breitner book, page 147, Pascal Company for uh, some of the differences between 
current assets and current liabilities. Um, I want to talk a little bit about working capital um, and how we raise capital when we're starting a company or when we need additional funds. So one of the ways we do that is we issue bonds and bonds are when we promise to pay someone at a later date and so when we do that we record that we got cash right and cash went up so that would be a debit but we have a liability we have to then pay that back at some point so we credit bonds payable. Continuing with equity uh, there are different types of uh, equity accounts that we've gone through but uh, typically we see paid in capital that's the amount that a person has put in sometimes referred to owner's equity and retained earnings and we're familiar with retained earnings that's how our profits each year build up when we close out our temporary accounts we close those out to retain earnings at each period so here if Mary was to open her own physical therapy shop and uh, she put in five thousand dollars of her own money we would record this how so we would debit cash and we would credit paid in capital or an equity account. We're not going to spend much time on partnerships but uh, that's generally when two or more persons start an entity and uh, they decide to use that form of uh, uh, forming the entity a partnership. Another one is when we have corporations so this could be a for-profit corporation where they issue stock and so we have different types of stock. We're not going to get too much into that. Some things to remember related to retained earnings. So remember that income increases equity and expenses decrease equity. Uh, for corporations who may distribute money to shareholders, they do that in the form of a dividend. And a dividend decreases equity. We use some terms interchangeably, so of note, earnings is another name for net income. And if earnings are not distributed as dividends, they are retained, right? And so therefore, retained earnings would increase. If I care, let's look at this example, has at the beginning of the year retained earnings of 60000 and they have earnings of forty, and then they pay out twenty in dividends, the balance at the end of the year. Right would be 60 plus 40 less what they distributed 20 is 80k. Uh, we talked about dividends and to record dividends that we would pay out, we would debit retained earnings and credit cash. So I mentioned we weren't going to get too much into dividends, um, but just for your knowledge. An entity is never required to declare a dividend, um, but they are required if they issue bonds to pay interest on the bonds each year. So thinking about that, which is more risky? Raising capital by issuing stock or issuing bonds? So I would say that bonds are a little more risky because you're required to pay that interest out each period. So that ends chapters 7 and 8.